welcome to Reflections, a program sponsored by Paducah Cooperative Ministry, an interfaith, interdenominational uh, ministry in the Paducah and McCracken County area of Western Kentucky. Uh, this program uh, is a program in which we look at different scripture passages and discuss them from the perspectives that comes from we find in our own denominations. We find agreements and disagreements uh, on how we look at scriptures. Today we're going to be looking at the New Testament and uh, we'll be looking across the four Gospels, well, actually three of the four Gospels. We may get into the fourth Gospel uh, and uh, specifically there's a specific story in which Peter um, confesses, um, it's called the, the Confession of Peter, Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ. You will find this in Matthew 16, in Mark chapter 8, and in Luke chapter 9. With me in this discussion today, I would like to uh, welcome uh, the Reverend Dan Masden of First Christian Church Disciples of Christ here in Paducah, and also uh, Brother Dan Owen of Broadway Church of Christ in Paducah. My name is the Reverend Brian Cope, and I'm of the United Church of Paducah, United Church of Christ. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. Now, we're looking at uh, three <coughs> different passages, and like I said, we may get into John, although John does not have this specific parallel in uh, his gospel, uh, in which Jesus is with his disciples, and he turns at a certain point and asks them the question, who do people say that? the Son of Man, or I am. And then the disciples answer him, and then Peter narrows the answer. Uh, this is a critical point in the Gospels because of the fact that in the Gospels, this is the first time that there is an identification of Jesus and his role specifically with the disciples. So um, let me uh, throw it out uh, to you um, and uh, to let you say, what do you see the significance of this uh, specific story is for the Bible, for the Gospels, and for us? And let's go with Dan Owen first. <clears throat> well, I'll pick Luke's text first in Luke 9. Okay. And uh, this uh, passage is preceded by several questions in Luke's Gospel uh, that all read, Who is this? For example, in Luke 9, 9, Herod says, I beheaded John, but who is this about whom I hear such things? Mm -hmm. And so who is this? You go back to Luke 8 and verse 25 at the calming of the sea thing, and uh, it says, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And then go back to Luke 7, verse 49, when uh, Jesus forgives the woman of the street and the guests begin to say, among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Mm -hmm. So the who is this questions lead us in Luke's gospel to the uh, story of the uh, confession, and then Jesus poses that same question, who do the crowd say that I am? Mm -hmm. And then Peter uh, finally answers his question, who do you say that I am? So the identity of Jesus and the role of Jesus is something that's kind of the crescendo that's been working up to to this point, and it seems to be a very, very crucial text mm -hmm. for that. Okay, Dan? You know, uh, taking the Gospel of Mark, I can see it the same sort of way, that it leads in and then leads <coughs> out uh, to Mark's understanding of how Messiahship is defined. Mm -hmm. And Jesus begins to teach them in a, what I understand to be a little different way after uh, the confession of Peter at, at Caesarea Philippi. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I agree, I think that in every gospel it sets up maybe a, a change of perspective or a definition and we move from this in, then into uh, an interpretation of what some would call the passion narratives or right. uh, how we approach things and appropriately as we're taping this, we're in Holy Week, so it seems mm -hmm. to me to be uh, very appropriate for us to, to deal with this this week. Right. Do they give him the right answer? That's an interesting question. Uh, he gets to go first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've just had a discussion about Brian's question, so that's <laughs> always a way to trip us up a little bit. Uh, an, an interesting question, because I, uh, the, um, I was reading a commentary not long ago about, about this, and the, the commentator was saying that he thought some translations, or really transliterations, had, had mistranslated the Greek Christos, 
uh, and it should be Messiah, not Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the reason I talked about Mark, because I think Mark shifts the understanding as Christ redefines the suffering of, of, of the one who is called to be the anointed. Okay, let me, let me stop you there for our audience, because I think that's, uh, you're, you're making a distinction here that maybe many of us don't understand, and that is that, mm -hmm. is there a difference between Messiah and Christ, or are they just the same word, but the Messiah is the Hebrew version of the Greek word, which is uh, Christos? Uh, either one of you want to jump into that, or, or are they different? Well, well, I think that um, they're not different. They are equivalent terms, one in Greek and one in Hebrew, but to, to agree with something Dan said a moment ago, Jesus definitely redefines mm -hmm. what the Messiah is. Even his own, his own role in the Gospels is totally different than what the disciples and the, and the people of that country expected the Messiah to be, right. as opposed to a, a military uh, ruler or leader that would drive out the Romans, he turns out to be the suffering servant that would die for the sins of man and the one that denies himself and mm -hmm. leads us in all those things. And I think when Peter said, you are the Christ, that Peter had it right that he was the Christ, but did not understand what the content of that was. And that's why Jesus said, don't tell anybody that, because he yeah. knew everybody would get the wrong idea. Okay, that, that's a good point, because I, that was a question I was going to ask later. Why does he tell him not to tell anyone? But, but if he says it in that way, then everybody's going to get the wrong idea. So uh, the, uh, the, the changing the concept, I, what I find fascinating about this whole passage is that uh, they, the, the gospel writers artfully in, in record what Jesus has done here, and that is that they've interwoven three very distinct characters or images in... Um, the Hebrew mind um, that were very distinct, and that is the Son of God was not the Son of Man, was not the Messiah. These are very, you know, now we all today on this side of the cross understand that they're all three the same. They're all three to refer to Jesus. But uh, uh, can you help us? Um, do, you, do you know the difference between the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the Messiah? Because they're very three different characters. And uh, do you want to talk about that for a minute? Either one of you two? I think it was interesting that the church, or let me say, it, my understanding is the church defined um, maybe even this passage as uh, Christ rather than Messiah, mm -hmm. maybe because the Messiah was a problematic term, just as Dan mm -hmm. Owen has said. Um, the, uh, the Jewish followers of Jesus would have had a much different understanding of the Messiahship than the anointing of uh, the one, the Holy One, as John's Gospel said, uh, the Christ. Uh, so it's not just Mark's Gospel. I think the, the primitive church, which was before the early church, maybe helped in defining Jesus as Christ and um, moving away from a, a definition of Messiahship. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that's just my interpretation of right. how the church dealt with the difference in terms. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, well, I think that um, definitely Son of Man is a different concept, uh, Brian, but I'm not sure that Son of God is in Jewish thinking, mm -hmm. because Christ, the Anointed One, and Son of God both go back to Psalm 2. Uh -huh. And in Psalm 2, as God uh, chooses and anoints His King, He says, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten Thee. And in, in Psalm 89, 26 and 27, when God is talking about choosing David as king, God says, I will make him my firstborn, you mm -hmm. know, when he makes him king. And uh, John 1, verse 49, Nathanael says to Jesus, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Mm -hmm. So Son of God, in a strictly Jewish psalm understanding, would have been equivalent to Messiah in the sense of that's the one God has chosen to be the king. Mm -hmm. But aren't there some prophets in the Old Testament that are referred to as the son of God? A son of man. Okay. Ezekiel, for example, is, is the son of man. Mm -hmm. And uh, son of man tends to come out of Daniel 7, you know, the right. son of man. And right. that was a different right. concept. And but certainly, I'm thinking either Jeremiah or Isaiah, one of the two, and I'm sorry I don't of have God? the references to refer to as he, uh, maybe, I I, maybe, maybe I misinterpreted this all along because I, as I understood it, it was the, uh, the Son of God was that uh, someone who represented God's point of view to humanity. Son of Man was representing human's point of view to God, so that it was uh, in, in a kind of representative. I, I would agree with that. 
understand. The, uh, but I, like I said, I, I may have misinterpreted. But uh, don't know where the passage is. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well, let's not hold our breath. This, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> this could have been in the Gospel of Brian. You know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but it seems like I was thinking it's either in Jeremiah yeah. or Isaiah that uh, one, uh, some other prophet <laughs> was referred to as the Son of God. And, uh, the, um, but. Well, let the viewers beware. Yeah. That's my, thing, my interpretation. So. I'd like to ask Dan, since Matthew is the only one that says, as a part of the confession, you are the son of the, the living God, and that's not in Mark, it's not in, uh, uh, well, Luke says the Christ of God, the anointed of God. Mm -hmm. um, since you were, you were uh, dealing with the sonship, does that make a difference that Matthew is the only one that specifically says that, or do you re translate in a... A different way does that uh... now they're they're all three actually worded in a slightly different uh, right. fashion that, uh, that, that's the question I guess one of them in uh, uh, simply mark I guess is the most brief the Christ mm -hmm. right Luke God's anointed God's mm -hmm. Christ and God's anointed by the way is almost a direct quote out of Psalm 2 the Lord's anointed you know they've mm -hmm. set themselves against array and against the Lord and his anointed and uh, so uh, I don't think that, to me, there's a, there's a real uh, point on the living God. Uh, the thing that strikes me most uniquely about Matthew is, is not that part, but the part that Matthew is the only one that he says, upon this rock I'll build my church. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. yes. Gospels don't uh, right. record that, and I guess we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Sure, we will. The, um um, well, before we get to that, let me, let me start out with the first difference in the three Gospels, uh, because what Mark and, and Luke start out with is the question that Jesus asked them, and that is the question, who do the crowds or who do people say that I am? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. in Matthew, he says, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Mm -hmm. Now, we've not, the disciples have not, or we don't have any indication in the Gospels that they've made that connection between Jesus being the Son of Man. So, uh, in, um, and so I think you could read that as a very big difference in these Gospels as Jesus poses the, the initial question um, so yes. that uh, what he's actually asking is different. Uh, because I think in Luke and Mark you get almost a surprise because what they answer with is the Messiah, the Christ, and then he talks to them about the Son of Man. Yes. And, uh, you know, and you get this impression these poor disciples must be walking around going, what is he talking about, <laughs> you know? Well, his, his term, the Son of Man, and I think uh, T.W. Manson and a lot of people who have studied Christology and the Gospels have pointed this out, that, that uh, the Son of Man was Jesus' personal term that he used to refer to himself. He didn't go around referring to himself as the Son of God mm -hmm. or the Christ, right. for that matter. Right. Mm -hmm. He referred to himself as the Son of Man, and, and I think part of the reason was the misunderstanding accruing to the term Messiah or Christ would not accrue to that term. Uh -huh. And the, the Daniel character, Daniel uh, 7, was both a character of suffering and a character of uh, uh, great authority over all mm -hmm. individuals. So the redefinition of his role was very effectively done in that title, Yes, though they kind of missed it, you know, no, that's as, right. as he that's, was dealing with it. That's right. <clears throat> Which is, a, and I agree, and uh, um, uh, having read the study you quotes, but the son, of, the reference to Son of Man, which raises an interesting question then, when we as uh, uh, churches call forth confessions from our, our members, believers, uh, the community of faith, we ask them to make Peter's confession, you are the Christ, and then we add in other things. Um, which become doctrinal and creedal and, and uh, uh, that which separate churches. But, but I've always found that interesting. Christ referred to himself as Son of Man, mm -hmm. but we use Peter's confession, you are the Christ, the Son mm -hmm. of the living God, or is, I mean, I, I think that's what we basically use. Well, now, use. we don't use Peter's confession. Oh, okay. And uh, so it, would, uh, it, it wouldn't come up in our church, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's, a, um, that's something that you require uh, in, in your church as far as the... At Peter's confession? That, that would be uh, uh, the confession that's made when mm -hmm. people uh, make their profession or confession of faith, yes. In fact, interestingly enough, and this is off of the subject, but uh, the, the confession that we require is a, is a Trinitarian confession. It's mm -hmm. not a uh, uh, Peter's confession. <coughs> and, uh, so uh, what, what type of confession just off, since we're off the subject now? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
And, and this opens up a, a, an interesting subject because confessions in the New Testament, if I understand it right, were varied in their wording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for example, in Romans 10:9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, mm -hmm. uh, Philippians 2:9, uh, every or 11, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to right. the glory of God the Father. Uh, here, Peter says uh, the Christ. Uh, Martha and John 11, you know the Christ, the Son of the living God, even he who cometh into the world. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that there was any wooden right. wording right. of the confession. The basic point of the confessions, all of them though in the New Testament, is a pledge of allegiance to Jesus as Master, King, Lord in one's life, however you want to word it. Mm -hmm. It was the point of the confession that was the important thing, not mm -hmm. the wording of the confession right. in a specific way. It, it's interesting <clears throat> uh, talking about this subject because in seminary I remember, uh, and they were beating us up about the uh, Christology. What's your Christology? What's your Christology? You know, was, was the historical Jesus actually the Christ? You went through all these questions, and I don't know if you two did, but we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to the point that there was no answer. I mean, there was no winning because there was no answer. Uh, and until one of the professors says that, uh, he says, you know, he says, the important thing about the confession is that it is in the present tense. We don't say who Jesus was mm -hmm. when we confess. We say who is Jesus, and Jesus is Christ, you know, and that's in this time and now, in this present tense. So uh, I think, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, well, let's talk about Matthew for a minute because he does give us this uh, problematic. I mean, you know, again, this is one of those sections that if you could have it all over again, can we just take this out, you know, and uh, life would have been a lot differently for the last 2,000 years in the church if we didn't have this. What do we do with this about, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what I'm referring to is Matthew, ch the 16th chapter, starting with verse 17, and Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, what do we do with that? Traditionally, this passage is a passage <clears throat> that the Roman Catholic Church has relied upon to, for the authority in which they claim as far as being the, the, the church. Uh, and I'm sorry that Father Brian Johnson couldn't be with here, and we, I promise you sometime in the future we'll, we'll stop what we're doing and pull him and get him down on this. But, uh, the, um, uh, but what does this mean? Does this give the authority, authority, authority to the Roman Catholic Church that it has, that this is, as they claim to be, the Church of Peter? I, I was waiting for you to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the passage they, they uh, take their authority from, mm -hmm. uh, from which they take their authority, excuse me. Um, but I think it gives authority, too, to um, all ecclesia, all communities of faith, too, that how we deal with authority and how we deal with understanding um, uh, and even confessions. So... Well, and I regret that Brian's not here because we need to hear his point yes, of view. That's right. Uh, I do not believe that this passage gives the church any authority. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter's name, Petros, mm -hmm. is different than the word Petra, rock, that Jesus uses. He uses the word Petra, which means a foundation stone, like in Matthew 7, 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house upon the Petra. Right. And uh, I believe that Jesus is making a pun off of Peter's name. Mm -hmm. Peter, you are Petros, which means pebble, and but upon this rock, Petra, I'll build my church. And in context, it's what Peter had just said. You are the Christ, mm -hmm. the son of the living God. Jesus is saying that it's on the foundational truth that I am the king of God's kingdom, I am the Lord, I am Christ, that my church will be built. It is the foundation of Christianity that Jesus is Lord, that mm -hmm. Jesus is Christ. Uh, later in the Pauline epistles, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is asserting his lordship 
blessing Peter for recognizing him as the king, the Messiah. <clears throat> and then the problematic part to me is in the next verse, because he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Well, that you there is a singular you, mm -hmm. and it has to refer to Peter. Mm -hmm. But the interesting part about that is, if you go to chapter 18, verse 18, he repeats the same phraseology in the plural to all of the apostles. Okay. So this was something that, that uh, could apply to all of the apostles and not just Peter. But definitely the apostles were the, um, uh, the beginners of the preaching of the gospel, the conveyors of the, the laws of heaven to earth and all those things. So uh, though the church is founded on the lordship, messiahship of Jesus, certainly the apostles had a crucial function in that. So mm -hmm. it's a very, very important passage. Maybe Dan's got some perspectives he'd like to throw in there on it. Well, I just, I think, uh, um, uh, I think the foundation stone would, would be a, a good understanding. But I, I also understand that it's not just a, a blessing that Jesus gives to uh, Peter, but it's, uh, you can translate it as fortunate, too. Fortunate uh, to understand, fortunate to have made this, um, this knowledge that has come to you. And that connects to me the, the whole understanding of how we relate as a community of faith. And that's the way I would translate that ecclesia, um, as, as others have translated as church. Mm -hmm. um, and that is an eternal thing, and the powers of, of death and evil shall not prevail against what I interpret as community of faith. So mm -hmm. I guess I, I disagree with Dan and to that um, specifically, that it does refer to, to church but I understand what you're saying with the singular and plural of the, mm -hmm. the you. Well, well, what I think is interesting, and, and this is with the scriptures themselves, is that if you compare this passage in Matthew with Mark and Luke, what you have here is that <coughs> Matthew has completely changed the whole uh, meaning of what this whole uh, the, the, the section is or uh, the story is about. Because what you get in the uh, other passages of Mar Mark and Luke is that Jesus says, uh, Peter answers, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ and then he sternly orders them not to tell anyone mm -hmm. and that's it and then he starts talking about the son of man suffering mm -hmm. now what he does in matthew is that he praises peter and he not only praises peter but says something in matthew that i don't think he repeats anywhere else in any other gospel and that is the establishment of the church uh, you know in luke i don't think the the whole question of uh, a church being established is even brought up into the book of acts uh so um you know, so I think Matthew takes this whole thing and turns it in a completely different direction than the other two Gospels go into. And uh, what are you <laughs> well, grimacing? I mean, to be fair here in verse 20, he does warn his disciples immediately after this not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And then consistent with the other Gospels in verse 21 and following, he begins to predict his sufferings and death. Okay. Very similar. So it's not that he doesn't do those things. But I think the whole interpretation of that sternly orders after you, you praise people and then you say, don't tell. What he's saying, I've got a secret. We've got a secret. We're going to keep this secret. Yeah. Whereas that what you pointed out earlier is it could be that he's saying that they misunderstood what the whole concept of the science. They go out and tell people this that everybody else is going exactly. to Exactly. He, he's praising Peter because mm -hmm. Peter has told the, the fundamental truth of all Christianity. Uh -huh. Peter's understanding of it is not correct. <clears throat> but Peter has definitely told the truth that's the foundation of Christian community from here on out, that okay. Jesus is the Christ. So that's why he praises him. But then he says, now don't tell anybody, because now, obviously they don't... Yes, and, and don't back me a corner and make, make the audience think that I'm, I'm saying that this is not important in Matthew. Because mm. you know, <clears> I know, I think it's, it's, it'd be easy to say, and I know some scholars have done this, is that, well, this is a gloss that was added into the manuscript many years after the Gospels were written, and I'm not saying yeah. that at all. I'm saying that, uh, but, but what we have, if, if all we had were the Gospel of Matthew, or if we didn't have the Gospel of Matthew, the whole meaning of what this thing, I mean, <clears throat> and, uh, for example, in Mark, uh, you know, it's very important in Mark to show in this whole passage that the disciples do not understand mm -hmm, who he is, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. which the others don't. Their uh, emphasis is different. It, it very in much the different so. ones. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in Matthew's Gospel, at the end of the Gospel, Unlike Luke and, and Mark, Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, mm -hmm. which really is pretty close to yes. you are the Christ. Mm -hmm. you know? right. and, and then he says, therefore, go and make disciples. 
So even there at the end of Matthew's gospel, the authority of the Christ is connected with the making of disciples, which right. is the church, which mm -hmm. is, you know, upon this rock I'll build my church. So it really is all connected the way Matthew has it but, but, but laid out there. But even look at this, is that the confession is a almost triumphal, you know, uh, as you just pointed out, you know, this is the authority of God's given to him, and, and he passes on to his disciples and, and through the disciples to the church. Whereas in both Matthew, I mean in Mark and Luke, the confession brings us right into the subject. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, not just don't tell anybody, but then he started to tell him that, and, and, and Matthew picks up on this too, but, uh, and then he tells him that I'm, he's going to suffer and he's going to, you know, and, and going to go into pa the, the Holy Week, uh, the um, um, road to Calvary, mm -hmm. as it were. And you get that interesting then uh, follow-up to this as uh, Peter rebuking him and then uh, get thee behind me, Satan. Um, the, um, which Matthew and Mark give us, but Luke doesn't give us at all. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I think it's interesting, Luke doesn't even, or, uh, Peter is really insignificant in Luke as far as the story goes, this, uh, mm -hmm. this whole passage. Um, the, um, we're not going to have time, uh, I know we're, we're, we're going to have to wind this up, so I want to end on this, this whole thing of the rebuking of Peter and the misunderstanding. Uh, because I wanted to go on and then talk about the next passage, which is the, uh, the conditions of uh, discipleship. And so we'll have to get that on another show. But uh, what, do you, what do you make of this uh, rebuking, uh, Peter rebuking him? Uh, I think Peter is um, much like us. I don't want to hear that. I don't, want, mm -hmm. I don't want you to talk about that anymore. Let's not talk about the negative things. Let's not talk about the, the suffering. Um, no one wants to follow somebody that's uh, talking negative all the time. Let's talk about the positive things. And uh -huh. I think that's the, um, for the rebuke is it's, um, uh, Jesus is saying, no, we have to talk about suffering. No, we have to redefine and, mm -hmm. and move that way. But Peter says what I would say. Well, let's, let's not bring the people down. Let's keep them up. Let's keep yeah. them positive. Yeah. And uh, do you have anything to add to that then? Well, I, I just think that it shows Peter's misunderstanding of the term Messiah. Peter says, you know, Messiahs don't die. They go to Jerusalem, whip the Romans, and rule like David ruled. You know, don't talk about being killed. And Jesus says, you know, you're not thinking about the things of God, but the things of men. Right. Jesus had a different role for the Messiah and tried to redefine it for him. And, uh, and I think it's also interesting, especially in Matthew, is that he just given Peter the keys of the kingdom. And then he calls him Satan. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and uh, the uh, which, and, and I, I think the question is: Is he talking to Peter and just referring to him as Satan, or is uh, is that just, uh, or is is this somehow, you know, is Satan actually in this story? Uh, do you? How do you guys interpret this? And I'm going. We're going to have to end on this too. So. <laughs> The, I think yeah. it's just a, a temptation to give in to what would be an easy way mm -hmm. to deal with Messiahship. Okay. I think he's right. He's just saying that Satan's using Peter's misunderstanding to potentially give a stumbling block to Jesus because it would have been an easy temptation for Jesus to take that way out instead right. of the suffering road to the cross. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's how I see it too, is that it would be, it's almost like Jesus is feeling an, a yet another temptation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so. Well, thank you. I'm sorry that we have to cut this off so short. There's just not enough time uh, to do these, but we will be back together and uh, talk about these, and, uh, and I'll bring you other questions that will be hard to answer. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for joining us, and uh, this is Reflections, a program of Paducah Cooperative Ministries. <laughs>